Welcome to the American Heritage Museum. I'm Rob Collins. I'm going to take you through a quick tour of some of the great artifacts and historic lessons we have from World War II and the Cold War we're going to cover today. Behind me is one of the star attractions at the museum. It's the German Panther tank, a Panzer V that was recovered from the rivers of Poland and restored back to its original condition. There's a lot of artifacts here at the museum that are the only ones you're going to see in the United States. In fact, over 20 of them are the only ones in the U.S. and several are the only ones in the world. So let's go take a quick tour. Everything in the American Heritage Museum is in a chronological order. So we're covering history from World War I up to present day. But we're going to focus today on World War II. And the first gallery we get to in World War II is North Africa, which started in 1943. Here we feature tanks like this British Matilda, the American M3 Lee, and then some of the German vehicles of that time period, including this SDKFZ 222 armored car. This is the only example left in the world today, and technologically, it's a rather remarkable vehicle for its time. Considering this was made in 1936, it has all-wheel drive, all-wheel steering. It features a 20-millimeter automatic cannon plus a machine gun, and then if you look at this hull, it's a V-shape. This allowed the vehicle, if it hit a mine, to deflect that blast away. Back in about 2003, 2004, in Iraq and Afghanistan, our troops were hitting lots of these IEDs on the side of the road, and they were causing a great deal of damage to the Humvees, and a lot of guys lost their lives, men and women lost their limbs. And it was after that that we decided we need to make these MRAPs using this same design that Germany had come up with in 1936. The second gallery we're moving into is the Italian campaign. And this features the M5 Stort, the Scout car, and a couple interesting German vehicles over here. Now, the Italian campaign was interesting. This was where we were liberating Italy. And it was before we had invaded uh, France and Normandy. And to a large degree, the Italian campaign was a bit of a ruse. It was to move German troops away so they couldn't defend the Normandy coast. So when D-Day came, we would have an easier time. But it was a very hard fought battle. And some of these interesting vehicles here on the German side are actually Volkswagens. And probably a little known fact to most people today is Volkswagen was a car company that was a state car company. It was actually started by Adolf Hitler. He was not only the start, the person who founded the company, but he also invented the Volkswagen Beetle or the bug that we know today. Very few of these Volkswagen Beetles were produced prior to the war starting. And the very first one was actually a birthday gift to Hitler. Ironically enough, Hitler never had a driver's license. But as soon as the war started, Volkswagen was producing war goods. And one of the most interesting ones is this Schwimmwagen, which is an amphibious Jeep. And if you look at the back side of it, it has a propeller because this is a boat. It's a car and a boat, so it can go in the water, cross rivers and lakes and so forth with its, it was motorized propeller and steering was accomplished by the front wheel. They made a lot of these, several thousand of these, including over a thousand that were built by another car company that everyone will recognize today, Porsche. Welcome to the arsenal of democracy. This is a factory here where we're showing how massive tanks like this M4 Sherman were produced during World War II. In the last gallery, we talked about Volkswagen and Porsche building war goods. Every country utilized their entire industrial base during World War II. So companies like Ford, General Motors, Chrysler, and so forth were all building tanks like this. Every company was involved in the war effort. And when you look at the, the massive amount of production that went on during World War II and the workforce that had to enter into the industrialized workplace, it was a monumental time. This was the first time we have blacks, Hispanics, and women in the industrialized workforce as well. So socially, it changed America forever. But it wasn't, if it wasn't for all those workers and the ability of these companies to start spooling up to build 
tanks, airplanes, ships, guns, you wouldn't have won the war. The most important, three important aspects, I think, of our success in World War II was production. We had massive amounts of uninterrupted production. We were not being bombed. Logistics. We could move this material to our front lines, to our allies, England and Russia. And then fuel. We had fuel and oil, and that was necessary. And if you're lacking any one of those three, it's impossible to fight the war effectively. Now we're moving into the Eastern Front. So World War II was a world war. It was being fought all over in the Pacific, in Europe, and part of Europe was the Eastern Front. And this is when uh, Hitler invaded the Soviet Union at a major, major cost of lives on both sides. The Soviet Union lost about 26 million people, civilian and military losses, and Germany lost about 8 million soldiers. Even though the Soviet Union was a communist country and not aligned with the U.S. and our beliefs and values, and out of it became the Cold War afterwards, which we'll talk about in a bit, they were an ally of convenience. And we were supplying Russia with all sorts of war goods, not only tanks and aircraft, but most importantly, trucks for that logistical movement, fuel, food, everything that kept them alive. And this was a country that's back was truly against the wall. We cannot even begin to imagine what sort of suffering and loss 26 million people had. To put it in perspective, we lost 400,000 people in the entire war. But the Soviet Union had a lot of interesting advances. The T-34-76 here was one of the best tanks of the war. On the personal stories, it is amazing to think about the million women, one million women served in frontline positions in the Red Army as pilots, as gunners and commanders on tanks, as snipers. And we feature some of those stories here about the women who were tank commanders and even snipers like this woman here. And this is an original Soviet sniper smock. And she was one of the most successful snipers of all time with 309 confirmed victories. It is not an overstatement to say that we would not have won World War II without the Russians, and the Russians could have not have won World War II without us. We supplied them with the equipment that they needed. They supplied us with their lives, basically. And that took a lot of the fighting away from the Western Front, from our invasion in Normandy, and made it possible for us to liberate Western Europe. While the war on the Eastern Front raged on from 1941 to 1945, this was a preparation time period. We didn't become part of the war until December 7, 1941. And then there was this buildup. We had to start building tanks, ships, and all the equipment that was needed. We had to start training troops. And it was only on June 6, 1944 that we entered Western Europe with the landings known as D-Day in Normandy in France. And how we got there were on these boats. These were called Higgins boats or LCVPs. And they were a specialized boat that was built to operate in the bayous in New Orleans by Anthony Higgins. Instead, we turned these into these landing craft because they could come up on the shallow shores, drop the ramp, and have their, our soldiers come out of them. 22,000 of these Higgins boats were built during World War II, and there's only eight survivors left today. This particular example is a D-Day surviving example that was used on the beaches of Normandy, but these types of boats were used in every amphibious landing throughout World War II, including in the Italian campaign at Anzio, Normandy, and all of those amphibious landings in the Pacific. Now, part of the D-Day landings were getting troops on the beachhead and securing the beachhead. As soon as that was accomplished, then we could start moving heavier equipment in. And these are two examples of tanks that were landing there on that day. This one is a 
very interesting vehicle called a Churchill Crocodile and it is actually a flame-throwing tank. And if you come and look inside, you can see these hoses going up to the flamethrower, and this is the way that they would shoot a propellant two, three hundred feet in front of them uh, to be able to burn out pillboxes and so forth. A very horrific, lethal weapon of the war. So after gaining the foothold in Normandy, our troops pressed inland. Americans, Canadians, British, all the Allied troops were pressing their way into France, building up this pocket that we had until we liberated Paris. Now the material's flowing in from England into France more readily, and we're pushing our way into Germany, liberating France, Belgium, and these countries along the way that had been under the Nazi oppression. And the largest battle ever fought by Americans was the Battle of the Bulge. And this was the winter of 1944 to 1945. It was cold, it was horrific. We were caught outside, unprepared, without the right equipment. And you could imagine spending a winter, not just any winter, but the coldest winter on record in Europe, outdoors, dug into these trenches, as the Germans have this massive assault coming back on us. And here's a couple vehicles that survived that massive assault and helped to liberate this, these towns in Belgium. This vehicle here is extraordinarily rare. It's what we refer to as a Jumbo Sherman. And you'll notice the armor is extraordinarily thick on this. Several inches of additional armor was added to the hull the turrets larger, the mantlets larger, and this was an assault tank designed to break through the enemy lines. In fact, the very first tank to liberate our airborne troops that were surrounded by the Germans in the town of Bastogne was one of these Sherman Jumbos. There's only a handful left in the world, less than five, and this one still shows some of the scars from the battle. If you look on the front, you can see the spalling of where a cannon round had hit it. A lot of it's been welded in, but that's evidence of the punishment that this tank has taken. After being victorious during the Battle of the Bulge, we were able to cross the Rhine. This is the river which really defines Germany. This was a major moment to cross the Rhine River. The war was close to being over at that point. People could feel it, but there was still a lot of fighting left to go. And in fact, the casualties in 1945, just from January through May, almost exceeded those of all of 1944, because now we're fighting on German homeland. And our troops were getting tired. they have been in battle a long time. But there's some new guys that came into the fray at that point. And this tank represents that. And these were called the Black Panthers. And this was the first African-American tanker unit. The military had segregated units back at that time. The most famous being the Tuskegee Airmen, the fighter pilots who flew. But also there were these black men who served on board tanks like this M18 Hellcat. Including in there was a Medal of Honor recipient, the nation's highest award. And probably the most famous of the Black Panthers was someone who became known very much, became famous for what he did later on, and that's Jackie Robinson. Another incredible artifact in this crossing of the Rhine Gallery is this British tank. It's called a Comet. It was one of the best British tanks of the war. It had a 17-pounder, a very high-velocity cannon. It had this V-12 engine that was the same type as used in a P-51 Mustang, so it was powerful and fast. But interestingly enough, we know the history of this exact tank, and we have photos of this tank crossing the Rhine River, and photos of the crew and what life was like. So back then, the tank crew didn't go out during the day and then come back and sleep in a bed in their bunks and so forth. When they came and they were on their tank and they went into battle for months on end, this was their home. This is where they lived. Everything was part of that. They would sleep underneath it. They would have a bucket as their shower. And this was their home. And in fact, this vehicle not only crossed the Rhine River, but also liberated the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp, one of the more horrific camps uh, during the, uh, the final solution. And 
the crew and the vehicle after going through Bergen-Belsen and, and liberating these people had to be sprayed down with DDT, a chemical to kill off bacteria because they were so concerned about the spread of typhus from these camps. There was diseases that were spreading in these camps that we hadn't seen in quite a long time because the conditions were just that horrific. Final galleries in the European theater is the Battle for Berlin, the final stages. Now the Battle for Berlin was not fought by Americans. These were Soviet troops that went in and took over the city of Berlin. The Cold War was starting early on. We think of it as 1947, but realistically, 1945, the Soviet Union and then the other allied countries like France, England, and ourselves were jockeying for position. And there was trade-offs. Berlin was, was a big prize for the Soviets. They had endured a very, very difficult war. It was deeply personal for them, and they wanted to exact revenge. We decided we would take, and we negotiated this, the Ruhr Valley. This was the manufacturing might of Germany. Everybody knew there was this future conflict coming. In fact, one of the most famous American generals, George Patton, said, we're here, we're mobilized, we need to continue on. Our enemy is the Soviet Union, um, foreseeing this Cold War that was coming. But we have a couple survivors here, and this is one of the most incredible survivors from the Battle for Berlin. This is a Soviet IS-2, or Joseph Stalin tank. This is a heavy tank. This was their largest vehicle they produced. It was the equivalent of a King Tiger uh, German tank. This was built in February of 1944 and saw battle all the way to it reaching Berlin as part of the 50th Guards Unit. And it shows a lot of its scars. You can see multiple holes where rounds had went through the cannon and the turret. You can also see the crude nature of the Russian construction. They didn't take any time to do anything and make it pretty. It was all about utility. It was a, a very pragmatic approach to construction. Some of the pictures we have here that we feature are of these tanks, these IS-2s, as they're entering Berlin, right by the Brandenburg Gate, one of the most iconic locations in the city. During World War II, Germany was being defended from the ground, this aerial assault. We had our bombers, B-17s, B-24s, during the day, and the British had Lancasters and their aircraft flying over and trying to take away Germany's ability to produce war goods and utilize their logistical uh, network. Take that away from them. If you can't build the tanks, the planes, or have the oil, or move them around to have those marshalling yards and railroads, your ability to fight back is going to be greatly diminished, and that's what the air war did. So Germany tried to defend themselves, and they did it with these flak guns, this 88 millimeter flak cannon that were all over the countryside. These can take an 18 pound projectile and shoot it five miles up in the air. And it's done with this amazing mechanical computer. There's only three of these left in the world, and this is like a giant Swiss watch. This is a computer of the 1940s. Um, it's not electronic like we think of today. It is a mechanical computer that would come up with firing solutions to allow these flak guns to shoot at these bombers as they're coming over Germany. Now, a lot of people understand leading a target, like a duck. If you're shooting at a duck, you have to aim in front of it as it's flying. Now think, when this cannon fires, from the moment the projectile leaves the barrel, to when it gets to the altitude of about 25,000 feet where the bombers are at, those bombers have traveled one mile. So this is a pretty complex solution that they needed to figure out to fire these guns. And the people who were manning these were young. These were 14, 15 year old boys and girls. And we have some incredible artifacts here, including this flak helper's uniform, which was a female. Uh, as I said, young Hitler youth, were the ones that were manning these cannons, because at that point in the war, Germany had very little manpower left. 
Now we're crossing into the Pacific Gallery. The war in the Pacific was very different than Europe. It was not much of a land war. We were landing on tiny little islands. There wasn't a major continent where they had massive tanks, yet there were tank battles. Uh, but the Pacific was mostly defined by major naval engagements and the use of air power uh, and these amphibious landings. We do have one Japanese tank here, and this is a Type 4 Horo. This is the only example left in the world today of this tank. And this particular vehicle was captured by Clark Field on Luzon in the Philippines late in the war. And a couple of these had taken out a few Shermans before the crews had to retreat into the woods. And it was brought back um, and put on display. And we're very, very fortunate to have this vehicle on display from the National Museum of the Marine Corps. Another amazing artifact from the Pacific is this massive LVTA-4. And this is a tank and a boat mixed together. This was for amphibious landings. So while it's an armored vehicle, it can still float and swim and use these tracks to swim through the water with these large cups on it. There was different variants of these. A lot of them were used to carry Marines and they had a ramp in the back which they come out of. This is an LVTA, the A meaning armored, has a turret on it, so it would provide fire support as they landed on these islands. And this is painted up to be exactly the way it was when it would have landed on Iwo Jima. And you'll even notice close up that everything's painted by hand because these vehicles went overseas green and they decided we need to break up the profile a little bit and they came up with some pots of paint, set them down and the guys just took out some brushes and painted them up and that's the way they would have looked during World War II. The American Heritage Museum is not just about tanks, it's about telling historical stories and people's stories as well. And one of the most interesting stories here and most interesting artifacts is this Curtis P-40B Tomahawk. Not only is it the only P-40B left in existence, it's also a survivor from Pearl Harbor. So on December 7th, 1941, this aircraft was at Wheeler Field on Oahu when the Japanese attacked. We had about 80 of these fighter planes there and almost 70 were destroyed that day. This is the only surviving example of any type of fighter plane left from the attack on Pearl Harbor that has survived to this day. We're very, very fortunate to have it here as part of the museum. And another one of the incredible artifacts here is this Grumman F6F Hellcat. As I mentioned, the war in the Pacific was defined by naval engagements, really the aircraft carriers. This was the most incredible technology of the time period where we were having naval engagements where the ships would never see one another. They would launch the aircraft from the aircraft carriers and they would do battle over the other persons, the other enemy's fleet. The aircraft that really was responsible for destroying Japanese naval aviation was the Hellcat. These aircraft had a 19 to 1 kill to loss ratio, meaning they would shoot down 19 Japanese aircraft, predominantly the Zeros, for every one of these lost. That was a phenomenal feat. 500 of these Hellcat pilots became aces, meaning they had five or more victories. And the most victories of any American fighter plane in history is the Hellcat and yet there's very, very few of these left today. This one's completely restored, and while it looks like on the nose, that's graffiti, those are the way they would paint numbers on as they left the factory. And this was so the test pilots knew which airplane to go out to. And one of the most remarkable stories here, the test pilot of this aircraft was a woman. There were three female test pilots at Grumman in the 1940s, and Cecil Teddy Kenyon here flew this aircraft before it was delivered to the U.S. Navy and went to the war in the Pacific. And she was quite a famous aviatrix of the time and featured in a lot of magazine articles and advertisements. One of the storylines we like to try and have people understand as they come through the museum is how war begets war.
World War I was the catalyst for World War II. World War II was the catalyst for the Cold War, for Vietnam, for other conflicts. So there's always this reaction to whenever there's a conflict. The Cold War was the longest war we've been involved with, but it was never what we would define as a hot war, a shooting war. But we were always in this jockeying position with the Soviet Union and NATO, uh, United States and the European countries. We have a couple artifacts that are here from this Cold War period. We're focusing in on the European side of the Cold War here, although we talk about all of the different aspects. We have galleries on Vietnam and Korea, two major conflicts on Cold War, as well as Afghanistan, where the Soviet Union and the U.S. were sparring partners to a degree. We wouldn't fight directly, but we would supply other puppet states uh, with the weapons that they needed. But Europe was the, the prize. This was the big, um, issue during the Cold War where the Iron Curtain descended, split Germany into two different countries, took the Eastern European countries, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and so forth, and put them under communist rule, while the Western part of Europe, West Germany, France, England, and so forth, were the free nations. A lot of this equipment was Soviet design, but built in these other countries. So here's an example of a Soviet T-72 tank that was built for the East German market. And even over here, this T-55 still has its original Czech markings when it was in Czechoslovakia. So all of these countries were under the iron fist of the Soviet Union. And there is nothing that really defines this quite as well or illustrates it as a piece of the Berlin Wall. This wall that was built in Berlin to differentiate East and West. They would say it was to keep the people from the West from coming into East Berlin, but in actuality, it was all the people in the East and the communist side trying to flee because the conditions were so horrific. And the Soviets really were using this as payback. Uh, a lot of East Germany was not even touched or rebuilt until after this wall came down. But this is a section from Potsdamer Platz, and this spread the whole length of Berlin. And you can see in these photos what it was like. This is just part of what this wall was like. And in between you have this no man's land. This is where there is barbed wire, machine gun nests, very, very angry German shepherds. And your chances of getting across this wall were very, very slim. But it was in the late 80s when the Cold War started to fizzle out. It came to a, a head and then finally the Soviet Union collapsed. And there was a lot of pressure. And probably the most famous line was from Ronald Reagan. He said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And Gorbachev was the premier of the Soviet Union. And pretty shortly thereafter, the wall came down and Germany became one country yet again.